From VOA Learning English, this is the Agriculture Report. The United States Senate recently voted to cut a program that makes $5 billion a year in direct payments to farmers. But the Senate agreed to add new subsidies that critics say could hurt farmers in other countries. The vote was part of a $955 billion farm bill approved by a wide majority in the Senate. Ten days later, however, the House of Representatives defeated its own version of the farm bill. The Senate bill would cut about $24 billion from the federal budget over 10 years. Some of those cuts come from direct payments. Farmers receive direct payments whether they had good years or bad. But high crop prices and historically high farm profits have made the payments politically unpopular at a time of reduced federal spending. The Senate bill would help farmers manage the risk of bad weather and bad markets. It would do this by offering crop insurance to farmers raising crops that had not previously been insured. And it would make payments to farmers if prices drop too much. Supporters say the goal is to help the American farmers who supply the nation with food. But critics say the bill goes too far. Some say the proposed new guarantees to pay farmers if prices drop could cause trouble for the United States at the World Trade Organization. Other countries could claim that the policy suppresses prices in world markets. The bill would also let the government buy $60 million in emergency food aid closer to where a crisis is happening. Supporters say doing that is faster and cheaper than shipping food from the United States and could save more lives. For VOA Learning English, I'm Mario Ritter. This is the VOA Special English Agriculture Report. Soil conservation methods help farmers protect their land from the damage caused by farming and the forces of nature. One method of soil conservation is the use of windbreaks. Windbreaks are barriers formed by trees and other plants. Farmers plant these barriers around their fields. Windbreaks help prevent the loss of soil. They stop the wind from blowing soil away. They also keep the wind from damaging or destroying crops. Windbreaks can be highly valuable for protecting grain crops. For example, studies have been done on windbreaks in parts of West Africa. These studies found that grain harvests were as much as 20% higher in fields protected by windbreaks compared to fields without them. But here is something interesting about windbreaks. They seem to work best when they allow some wind to pass through the barrier of trees or plants around a field. If not, then the movement of air close to the ground will lift the soil. Then the soil will be blown away. For this reason, a windbreak works best if it contains only 60 to 80 percent of the trees and plants that would be needed to make a solid line. 
An easy rule to remember is that windbreaks can protect areas up to 10 times the height of the tallest trees in the windbreak. There should be at least two lines in each windbreak. One line should be large trees. The second line, right next to it, can be shorter trees or other plants with leaves. Locally grown trees and plants are considered the best choices for windbreaks. Studies have shown that some kinds of trees can grow well even if the quality of the land is not very good. One kind of tree is the white pine. Another is the loblolly pine. Windbreaks not only protect land and crops from the wind. Surplus trees can be cut down and used or sold for wood. Trees reduce the damaging effects of wind and rain. Their roots help protect soil from being washed away. And trees can provide another valuable service for agriculture. They can provide grazing animals with shade from the sun. For VOA Special English, I'm Carolyn Prasuti. For MP3s and transcripts of our stories, along with activities for English learners, go to voaspecialenglish.com. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and iTunes at VOA Learning English. This is the VOA Special English Agriculture Report. A burro is a small donkey. The name comes from Spanish, and before that, from a Latin term for a small horse. Donkeys are related to horses. Both are part of the equine family. Burros reach an average height of more than one meter. They can weigh more than 225 kilograms. The long-eared animals are often gray with white noses, jaws, and undersides. But they can also have coats of red or blue. Burrows are known for their sure footing on mountains while carrying heavy loads. Americans know about them mainly from a history of use as pack animals in Arizona and other areas of the desert southwest. Gold miners and others imported them to work. Animals that escaped or were freed became the ancestors of burrows in the wild today. But burrows are not only good pack animals. They can also help calm and control nervous horses and guard sheep and goats on farms. Robin Ravello from the American Mustang and Burrow Association says burrows have even protected farm animals against bears. People may have the idea that burrows and donkeys do not like being told what to do. Experts say the animals are not being stubborn. They just like to take their time to consider what they will do. In the United States, there are breeders who raise and sell burrows. Americans can also adopt a burrow removed from the wild by the Bureau of Land Management, a federal agency. People who get a wild burrow need to gentle the animal. Gentling means training it to accept the human attention needed for care and grooming. Burrows like to clean each other. These desert animals groom themselves with dust. So it is normal for a burrow to have some dirt in its coat. A brush can remove hardened mud. 
Experts advise owners not to let their burros eat too much. Being overweight can ruin their health. Robin Ravello says a burro's feet should be cleaned and cared for every six to eight weeks. But she warns owners not to raise the feet as high as with a horse. A burro's legs differ from the legs of a horse. The pain could make the burro kick. And that's the VOA Special English Agriculture Report. Go to voaspecialenglish.com for transcripts, MP3s, and captioned videos of our reports. You can also follow us on Twitter at VOA Learning English. From VOA Learning English, this is the Agriculture Report. Scientists and agricultural experts recently met in Italy to talk about how to fight cassava disease, a virus that has been killing this important crop in East Africa has now spread to West Africa. Experts are concerned that it could spread quickly throughout West Africa, including Nigeria. Nigeria is the world's largest producer and consumer of cassava. Cassava is a tropical root vegetable that requires little work. It grows well in poor quality soil and high temperatures. The roots are full of carbohydrates, vitamins, and minerals. Cassava can also be used as an industrial starch to produce plywood, textiles, and paper. Cassava is sometimes called a miracle crop for Africa, but plant diseases have been a problem for about 100 years. One particularly bad virus is cassava brown streak disease. It began infecting cassava fields in East Africa 10 years ago. Now it has spread as far west as the Democratic Republic of Congo. Brown streak disease is spread in two ways, by white flies and by infected stem cuttings. Farmers use these cuttings instead of seeds to plant their fields. Claude Fouquet is a plant virus expert. He heads the Global Cassava Partnership for the 21st century. He says it is hard to see signs of the disease in the plant itself. Instead, it becomes visible in the roots when the plant is harvested. He says scientists and organizations have to find a way to offer farmers virus-free plant cuttings. Claude Fouquet says scientists are experimenting with a virus-resistant cassava plant in Tanzania. Experts warn that brown streak disease could reduce cassava production in Africa by 50 percent. For VOA Learning English, I'm Mario Ritter. Report. America is the world's largest food exporter, but the worst drought in half a century is hitting corn and wheat harvests. The drought across the central United States adds to concerns about world food supplies and prices in the coming years. Experts say by 2050, the world will have to produce at least 60% more food to feed a population growing bigger and richer. China, a major food importer, is looking to producers around the world 
to guarantee future food supplies. China has invested in food production in Australia and New Zealand. A new source of supply is Ukraine. Ukraine was known as the breadbasket of Europe because of rich corn and wheat harvests a century ago. Galina Kovtak is chief executive of Ukraine's largest agricultural business, ULF. She predicts that within a few months, her company will be approved to export corn to China. That will make Ukraine the first country outside the Americas to do so. ULF will soon have almost 2 million tons of elevator storage capacity as it prepares for the Chinese market. Chinese money is financing the building of six grain elevators. But the company's equipment is largely American, including half a million John Deere combines to harvest wheat. ULF's grain production per hectare is now halfway between the Ukrainian average and the high yields of the American But farming depends on the weather. Across the Black Sea area, in Ukraine, Russia, and Kazakhstan, drought this year is pushing harvests down. 15 to 20 percent. Traditionally, the Black Sea region is the main source of wheat for North Africa and the Middle East. But this year, on the supply side, Russia may have to suspend exports. And on the demand side, Africa and the Middle East are now competing with China. At the same time, a new report says large parts of Asia may face long periods of severe drought within 10 years. The report is from the British-based Center for Low Carbon Futures, a network of universities. It says northern China, India, Afghanistan, Mongolia, and Pakistan will be especially hard hit. It says other parts of Asia are likely to face longer and wetter monsoon seasons because of climate change. Okay. Works for the agricultural technology company Syngenta. He says a lack of new investment in technology to help farmers improve productivity has caused problems for agriculture. This is the VOA Special English Agriculture Report. American farmers traditionally keep their animals and equipment in barns that are rectangular. But there are hundreds of barns in the Midwest and other parts of the country that are different. They are not longer than they are wide or wider than they are long. These buildings are round. Round barns have a long history in America. George Washington, the nation's first president, had a round barn in the 1700s. The Shaker religious community at Hancock, Massachusetts, built one in the 1820s. But the idea did not become popular until years later. Then, in the early 1900s, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign built three round barns that many farmers copied. A farmer could save on wood or stone with a round design that needed less material than traditional barns. Experts also believed that farmers could save footsteps and time in feeding their animals in a round barn. And round barns stood a better chance against strong winds. Some round barns are not truly circular. They just look that way, 
but really are many flat pieces put together side by side. Early versions were mainly designed with two levels. Cows were kept on the first floor and the one above was used to store hay. Later designs brought a large area in the middle for the hay and feeding stations all around for the cows. By the 1930s, however, fewer American farmers were building round barns. Some people said it took more time and skill. Others disagreed. In any case, it was not a good time to argue. It was the Great Depression and times were difficult. Also, as electric power came to rural America, some people believed that rectangular barns were easier to wire for electricity. Agricultural experts also reconsidered their ideas about a round barn saving time in feeding animals. Kathy and Bob Friedenlund owned the Round Barn Llama Farm in New Richmond, Wisconsin. The Friedenlunds have a library of architectural plans and drawings and have published books on the subject. Money from their book sales helps them take care of their own barn. It is nearly a century old, made of concrete and wood. Bob Friedenlund says, having a round barn means keeping alive part of the history of American farming. And that's the VOA Special English Agriculture Report. Transcripts and podcasts are at voaspecialenglish.com and captioned videos are on YouTube at VOA Learning English. From VOA Learning English, this is the Agriculture Report. Ivory Coast is the world's largest producer and exporter of the cocoa bean. But people have been illegally transporting or smuggling cocoa beans between Ivory Coast and neighboring Ghana for many years. Ivorian growers smuggled their cocoa beans into Ghana because prices were higher and more dependable there. But that has changed. Ghanaian money lost value recently, while Ivory Coast has become more secure after a period of unrest. Now, Ghanaian farmers are smuggling their beans into Ivory Coast, where they get a better price. The government in Ivory Coast has set a price for cocoa beans. It hopes that will help keep the beans in the country. At the same time, Ghana's money has dropped in value against the dollar by more than 40 percent. This has caused a loss of profits for the country's cocoa growers. They can make more money if they smuggle their crop to Ivory Coast. Ghanaian farmers who do not send their cocoa beans to Ivory Coast are urging the government to keep other farmers from doing so. One way to slow the smuggling would be to increase the price of cocoa in Ghana. But Ghana has a budget deficit, so it does not have the money to support such a move. These beans are needed to make chocolate. Ivory Coast, Ghana, and other West African countries together produce more than 65% of the world's cocoa crop. Industry experts estimate 
that up to 100,000 tons of beans have been smuggled into Ivory Coast from Ghana since last October. For VOA Learning English, I'm Alex Villarreal. From VOA Learning English, this is the Agriculture Report. The World Food Program says the increasing number of conflicts in the first half of this year has created a huge demand for food aid. The WFP says it has had to use airplanes to transport 50 times more food this year than in the first half of last year. The planes drop food into areas that are difficult to reach by land. The group's air service is called UNHAS, the UN Humanitarian Air Service. UNHAS planes carry food to people who cannot be reached by roads or rivers. UNHAS has transported about 7,600 tons of food so far this year. The planes have also flown more than 1,000 tons of supplies and equipment to 21 countries for the WFP and other aid organizations. More than 90% of the supplies went to just three countries the Central African Republic, South Sudan, and Syria. Conflicts in those countries have displaced millions of people. Cesar Arroyo is the WFP's flight chief. He says more than three million people in South Sudan alone are in need of food. He says about half of them cannot be reached easily and need help immediately. Mr. Arroyo also says it is about six to eight times more costly to transport food and other supplies by air than by road. He says it costs one billion dollars a year to use emergency transport planes to carry food and other supplies to areas of South Sudan. The WFP official says the situation in northern Iraq is becoming more difficult. The Sunni Islamist militant offensive has displaced many people. Hundreds of thousands of people fled to Erbil in Kurdistan from Mosul when the militants seized that city in June. For VOA Learning English, I'm Carolyn Prasuti. From VOA Learning English, this is the Agriculture Report in Special English. A researcher who helped make crops grow in dry areas has received this year's World Food Prize. Daniel Hillel was recognized for his work in developing what is called micro-irrigation or drip irrigation. It has made farming possible in places where there is little rainfall. Watering plants drop by drop has changed agriculture by reducing the amount of water needed to grow crops. Jan Hopmans, a researcher with the University of California at Davis, studies water-related issues in society. He says farmers now depend on drip irrigation in many areas, including vineyards in Spain, onion fields in Africa, and even farms in the United States. He says California grows about 50% of the fruits and vegetables for the continental United States. And he adds that is possible 
because of drip and micro irrigation techniques. The World Food Prize Foundation says Daniel Hillel was born in California at the beginning of the Great Depression. After his father died, his mother moved the family to Palestine, where her parents lived. The area eventually became part of the state of Israel. Daniel Hillel got his start in dryland farming as a settler in Israel's Negev Desert in the 1950s. Desert farmers were not able to send water through irrigation canals to their crops the way farmers have since ancient times. So, Daniel Hillel and others used the drip method to give plants just enough of what they needed right where they needed it. A plastic tube is often used to send water right to the base of trees or other crops. The method worked so well that soon Daniel Hillel was traveling the world showing others how to do it. For VOA Learning English, I'm Alex Villarreal. This is the VOA Special English Agriculture Report. Officials in Kenya are fighting a deadly disease attacking maize crops. Some Kenyan farmers say the disease has reduced crop production by as much as 60%. Last September, farmers in Bomet reported that a disease was destroying their maize or corn. The disease is called maize lethal necrosis. It makes the plant turn yellow and dry up. By January, researchers found the disease was spreading across the country's south and into central and eastern Kenya. Paul Omanga is a crop production officer with the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization. He says a study in July found that maize lethal ne necrosis had affected more than 64,000 hectares. Up to 80% of the crop was ruined. The FAO official warned that if the disease is not controlled, it would have a major effect on maize production in Kenya. Muo Kusina is a researcher with the Kenya Agricultural Research Institute. He is working with others to fight the disease. But he says there is no known way to treat it. Muo Kusina says the problem is that Kenyans do not have any experience with the disease. He says he has no idea of what to expect in the future. Researchers are investigating whether maize lethal necrosis is spread by insects or in seeds. When they know that, they may be better able to fight it. There are some things farmers can do. The FAO's Paul Omanga says he and others are telling farmers about the importance of crop rotation. That means planting different crops on the same field from year to year. But, he says, farmers must take more extreme action if they suspect the disease has infected their crops. Paul Omanga is calling on farmers to destroy all maize plants in fields that are infected. He says farmers can burn the plants or use them as animal feed. He says stems and leaves are all fit for livestock. But he warns that infected plants should not be left in the field because the virus will remain to infect the next crop. Paul Omanga says he is concerned about Kenya's food stability. This is causing some concern, he says, 
because maize is the staple food and any threat to maize production is a threat to food security in Kenya. America's Agency for International Development says the poorest Kenyans spend 28% of what they earn on maize. For VOA Learning English, I'm Laurel Bowman. From VOA Learning English, this is the Agriculture Report. The United Nations Environment Program says 200 million Africans go to sleep hungry. That number represents 23% of the population on the continent. A new UN study shows that 8 out of 10 countries facing the worst food shortages are in Africa. Recently, African experts, farmers and others gathered in Kenya for two days of discussion. They debated ways to feed the growing human population in Africa and deal with rising temperatures on Earth's surface. The UN's Climate Change Coordinator for Africa, Richard Munang, was one of the speakers. He noted a need to increase food production to feed the population. But, he said, it is important to find ways to feed people without destroying forests, rivers and seas that provide food. At the meetings, Emmanuel Dlamini served as a negotiator for One Africa, a group that fights extreme poverty in Africa. In his opinion, climate change is here to stay. He says African governments and farmers have to look for ways to deal with the changes. Most African countries depend on rain to prepare their farmland and to start growing crops. For the past few years, a lack of rainfall has affected several countries, making their populations dependent on food aid. African farmers say that a combination of unpredictable rain and rising temperatures creates an environment for crop diseases that affects production. The conference also heard from a representative of Nestle, one of the world's largest food companies. Nestle Africa's Hans Jor says farmers need assistance from food processing companies and non-governmental organizations. For VOA Learning English, I'm Alex Villarreal. This is the VOA Special English Agriculture Report. The United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization says deforestation has decreased over the past 10 years but it still continues at a high rate in many countries. Deforestation is mainly caused by the cutting down of tropical forests to provide land for agriculture. The world's total forest area is just over 4 billion hectares. About 13 million hectares of forest were cut down or lost through natural causes each year in the last 10 years. This compares with about 16 million hectares per year during the 1990s. The FAO study covers 233 countries and areas. The study found that Brazil and Indonesia have reduced their deforestation rates. The two countries 
had the highest loss of forests in the 1990s. In addition, the study noted tree planting programs in countries such as China, India, Vietnam, and the United States. These programs, along with natural expansion of forests in some areas, have added more than 7 million hectares of new forests each year. South America and Africa had the highest yearly loss of forests during the last 10 years. South America lost 4 million hectares. Africa lost almost 3.5 million hectares. However, Asia gained more than 2 million hectares a year in the last decade. In North America and Central America, the forest area remained about the same. In Europe, it continued to expand, but at a slower rate than earlier. Eduardo Rojas is Assistant Director General of FAO's forestry department. He said for the first time the rate of deforestation has decreased around the world. This is the result of efforts taken at local and international levels. Mr. Rojas said countries have improved their forest policies and legislation. They have also provided forests for use by local communities and native peoples, and for the protection of biological diversity. He said this is a welcome message in 2010, the International Year of Biodiversity. However, Mr. Rojas said the rate of deforestation is still very high in many areas. He said countries must strengthen their efforts to better protect and manage their forests. And that's the VOA Special English Agriculture Report. You can find transcripts, MP3s, podcasts, and captioned videos at voaspecialenglish.com. From VOA Learning English, this is the Agriculture Report. Cassava is a very important crop in many countries. More than 160 million people across Africa depend on the plant for food or to earn money. The continent produces 60% of the world's cassava. In May, the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization reported that cassava production had increased by 60 percent worldwide since 2000. Agriculture experts had been expecting world cassava production to grow even more during the next 10 years. But those expectations have been crushed. Plant diseases are attacking cassava crops in East and Central Africa. Two diseases are the cassava brown streak virus and the cassava mosaic virus. The Food and Agriculture Organization says brown streak disease does more damage since it affects the root of the crop. Luca Alanovi is the acting director of the FAO in East and Central Africa. He says the agency has taken steps to improve the situation, but the problem is not getting better. He says decisions on how to handle the problem will have a huge impact on the food security of people in Central Africa. Dominique Davou heads the European Union Rural Development and Agricultural Program in Kenya. 
She says the cassava diseases have changed over the years. She says early research slowed the disease, but the disease changed form and new research is needed. The FAO says at least $100 million is needed to study the diseases and support clean farm production. Experts say failure to stop the disease means cassava disease will likely invade Nigeria, the biggest producer of cassava in Africa. For VOA Learning English, I'm Carolyn Prasuti. This is the VOA Special English Agriculture Report. Has anyone ever tried to get your goat? To get your goat is an expression. It means to make you mad. A good friend might tell you, don't worry about what that person said. He was just trying to get your goat. But there are plenty of good reasons to get a goat. And not just for milk or meat. The animals can help control weeds. They can be friendly with children and adults. And they can make money with their hair. Cashmere goats produce cashmere. Angora goats produce, no, not angora. Angora fiber comes from rabbits. Angora goats produce mohair. Mohair is used to make clothing, carpets, and other products. The goats came from the Anatolian plains. Their name comes from the Turkish city of Ankara. The Mohair Council of America says the first Angora goats arrived in the United States in 1849. Seven females and two males were imported. Today, the United States is one of the world's leading producers of mohair. The other top sources are South Africa and Turkey. 90% of the mohair from the United States comes from Texas. An adult angora can produce as much as seven kilograms of hair each year. The value of the coat depends on the age, size, and condition of the goat. As angoras get older, their hair becomes thicker and less valuable. The goats need their mother's milk for the first three or four months. They reach full maturity at about two years. But even then, they are smaller than most sheep and milk goats. Cashmere goats are usually larger than angoras. Cashmere goats can grow big enough to be kept with sheep and cattle. The outer hair of the animal is called guard hair. Behind it is the valuable material on a cashmere goat. Some farmers just comb their cashmere goats to remove the hair. But if the goats do get a haircut, it often happens that when they would naturally lose their winter coat between December and March. Angora goats generally get their hair cut twice a year in the spring and fall. Owners do it themselves or hire a professional shearer. An angora without a coat can get cold. So the sheared goat may need to be kept extra warm for about a month after shearing. For VOA Special English, I'm Carolyn Prasuti. To read, listen, and learn English with our stories about agriculture and other topics, go to voaspecialenglish.com. You can also find captioned videos of our programs at the VOA Learning English channel on YouTube. 
This is the VOA Special English Agriculture Report. Years ago, a young forester took an unusual new job. Earl Cooley became one of the first smoke jumpers. Smoke jumpers parachute from airplanes. They fight fires that crews cannot reach quickly or easily from the ground. Earl Cooley worked for the United States Forest Service an agency of the Agriculture Department. The Forest Service had a plane that it wanted to use to drop water bombs onto wildfires. But that idea failed. So the agency decided to use the plane for what was then a new practice, smoke jumping. The first fire jump in the United States took place on July 12th 1940 in the Nez Perce National Forest in Idaho. Another smoke jumper, Rufus Robinson, went first. Then out came Earl Cooley. As he later described it, the plane was not much more than half a kilometer above the trees. The day was windy, and the jump was not as good as others he had made. He began to turn over in the air when his chute opened, and there were problems with the lines at first. But he chose a large spruce tree to land in near the fire and climbed down. With hand tools, he and Rufus Robinson threw dirt on the fire and dug a line to contain it so the flames would not spread. They worked through the night and had the fire controlled the next morning when other men arrived from a camp in the area. Earl Cooley always said he was not afraid being a smoke jumper. Over the years, he worked to develop the profession. He served as the first president of the National Smoke Jumper Association. He also wrote about his experiences, but not all had happy endings. On August 5, 1949, he was involved in a disaster at a forest fire near Helena, Montana. He had to choose where a crew would jump, but the wind changed and the fire grew unexpectedly, taking 13 lives. Many years later, Earl Cooley told a newspaper that he still believed he had made the best decision he could. He retired from the Forest Service in 1975. But he continued to visit the mountain where the men lost their lives until he could no longer make the climb. Earl Cooley died on November 9th in Missoula, Montana. He was 98 years old. Today, more than 270 men and women are smoke jumpers for the Forest Service. Smoke jumpers are also used in Russia and other countries. And that's the VOA Special English Agriculture Report. From VOA Learning English, this is the Agriculture Report in Special English. IKEA recently recalled frozen meatballs from its European stores after tests found some contained horse meat. Czech investigators said they found small amounts of horse meat in Swedish meatballs at an IKEA store in the Czech Republic. IKEA is the big Swedish company that sells furniture, but its stores also sell Swedish foods. The packaging said the meatballs contained beef and pork. IKEA said meatballs from the contaminated batch were sent to stores in some other European countries. They included Belgium, Britain, 
France, Spain, Italy, Greece, and the Netherlands. Recently, laboratory tests found horse meat being sold as beef in a number of European Union countries. The EU Law Enforcement Agency, Europol, is investigating the meat industry. Owen Patterson is the British Environment Secretary. He says the sale of horse meat as beef is unacceptable. He called it a fraud on the public. Millions of food items have been removed from stores, schools, and hospitals. No one has reported any health problems, and the French eat horse meat. But the situation has upset consumers across Europe. In Britain, horse meat was discovered in frozen meals sold by the Swedish-based frozen food company Findus. In France, an investigation has accused the French meat processing company Spangaro of knowingly selling horse meat as beef. The company denies the accusation. The EU requires the packaging of fresh meat to identify the country where it was produced. But in prepared meals, only the kind of meat used is required to be listed. For VOA Learning English, I'm Laurel Bowman. This is the VOA Special English Agriculture Report. Pastoralism remains a way of life in East Africa. Herders travel from place to place in the dry, dusty deserts to find food and water for their animals. But some people think this movement of livestock is bad for the environment. They say pastoralists should settle on farms and grow their own food, especially in times of shortages. Not everyone agrees. Experts recently met in Nairobi to discuss what to do about food shortages caused by drought. They say pastoralists make the best use of resources. David Wongi at the Kenya Agricultural Research Institute says grasslands have time to recover. He says pastoralists have to leave an area as soon as the water is exhausted. They move to the next area that has water. It gives the area they left time to regenerate before they come back. Mr. Wongi says the land used for animals is often not good enough for farming, especially during droughts. He and other experts say pastoralism makes the most sense for dry and semi-dry lands. Jeff Hill directs policy for the Bureau of Food Aid at the United States Agency for International Development. He says arid and semi-arid lands represent about 80% of the Horn of Africa. Livestock-based economies in these areas provide up to 40% of agricultural production in Ethiopia and 50% in Kenya. And in Somalia, Mr. Hill says the percentage is even higher. In Somalia, livestock systems fuel the economy. An estimated 90% of the meat eaten in East Africa comes from pastoralist herds. Mr. Hill says Kenya and other governments have only recently recognized the value of arid and semi-arid lands. These lands have often been excluded from government planning and road building. Herders can face limited access to grazing and watering areas. Researcher David Wongi says communities 
need to be creative with the resources they have. He says a good example is a project in Kenya in which grass is grown in the desert to feed livestock. What would happen if we developed a system where we grow fodder and pasture along the river and the animals are taken off from the range and finished nearer to the market? What we need is a system, and that is what has been really lacking. He also says more efforts need to be put into raising camels. Camels are often the only animals that produce milk during a drought. For VOA Special English, I'm Alex Villarreal. This is the VOA Special English Agriculture Report. East Africa's drought is the worst in 60 years. Scientists say the dry conditions in the Horn of Africa are at least partly the result of an event half a world away. The event is called La Nina, which means little girl in Spanish. A La Nina begins when waters become cooler than normal in the eastern Pacific Ocean near the equator. Changes in wind currents can then affect weather around the world. A related event, called an El Nino, happens when the waters become unusually warm. La Niñas and El Ninos happen about every three to five years. The latest La Niña began in July of last year and ended in May. The conditions can last for up to two years. Wasila Tiao studies Africa for the Climate Prediction Center at the National Weather Service in the United States. With the La Nina, Mr. Tiao says the easterly winds that are supposed to bring moisture into East Africa are reduced. And when that happens, rainfall is reduced. Starting late last year, rains that were supposed to fall over Somalia, southern Ethiopia, and northern Kenya failed. That part of the Horn of Africa has a second rainy season during March, April, and May. Mr. Tiao says that one failed too, but probably mostly due to the atmospheric conditions that prevailed at that time. He says La Nina conditions might begin again by the end of this year. And if that happens, he says then the October through December rainy season could again be drier than normal. Climate researcher Simon Mason at Columbia University in New York says East Africa has been getting drier over about the last 10 years. Mr. Mason says this is at least partly the result of global warming. Rising temperatures in the Indian Ocean create conditions that pull moisture away from East Africa. Claudia Ringler at the International Food Policy Research Institute also points to another issue. She said much of the land in the drought-affected areas is not very productive, even in good times. It will not get any better. Even if we have a bit more rainfall, the general potential for more food production is not expected to improve dramatically in the region. In the United States, the latest La Nina pushed moisture away from the south, causing severe droughts. Texas has suffered billions of dollars in agricultural losses. Changes in the winds push the rain toward northern states, causing floods. For VOA Special English, I'm Carolyn Prasuti. You can learn English and stay informed every day at voaspecialenglish.com.
from VOA Learning English, this is the Agriculture Report. Some countries have suspended imports of wheat from the United States. The suspensions were announced after an unapproved form of wheat was found in the state of Oregon. The crop was genetically engineered. An Oregon farmer recently discovered wheat in his field that survived the popular weed killer, Roundup. Roundup is made by the seed and chemical company Monsanto to destroy unwanted plants. The company has created genetically engineered corn, cotton, soybean, and canola crops that resist Roundup. Monsanto field tested Roundup resistant wheat, but it never sold the seeds. Michael Furco is with the United States Department of Agriculture. He says the wheat passed safety inspections. Monsanto ended its wheat project because buyers in Europe and Asia were concerned about the safety of genetically engineered crops. The discovery of unapproved wheat in Oregon led Japan and South Korea to temporarily suspend some imports. The United States is the world's largest wheat exporter, but American agriculture has difficulty competing against other countries because production costs are higher in the United States. Mark Welch is an agricultural economist at Texas A&M University. He says the incident could affect America's place in the world market. United States officials are working to identify the source of the genetically engineered wheat. There is no evidence yet that it has entered the food supply. The Department of Agriculture is working to make tests available to wheat buyers. For VOA Learning English, I'm Laurel Bowman. This is the VOA Special English Agriculture Report. About 800 million people in Africa, Asia, and South America eat cassava. The plant is a major source of food energy and a major food security crop. It can survive in poor soil and without much water. Also, the root can stay in the ground for as long as three years, so it can be harvested as needed. But in East Africa, the plant is under attack. Cassava brown streak disease is a more destructive form of cassava mosaic. The mosaic has been active in East Africa for about 100 years. It limits plant growth, but brown streak can destroy a crop. The virus was identified in Uganda in 2004 and has spread fast in areas extending from Lake Victoria. So far, brown streak has not jumped to Nigeria, the world's largest producer of cassava but it threatens more than 30 million tons a year of production in East Africa. In some areas of Uganda, rates of brown streak reached more than 85 percent in 2005 and 2008. Claude Fouquet is a scientist at the Donald Danforth Plant Science Center in St. Louis, Missouri. He says a few varieties of cassava can resist brown streak, 
but these are not the kinds Africans like. He is working to develop disease-resistant plants, but he says it will probably take five years. Loss of cassava crops could lead to hunger, and hunger can lead to migration and conflict. About $50 million is coming from the Gates Foundation, the Monsanto Fund, and the United States Agency for International Development. But Claude Fouquet says much more is needed to fight the disease. Brown streak can be hard to identify in the field. Irregular yellow spots may appear on lower leaves, but farmers sometimes do not find the disease until they cut open a cassava. If there is only a small amount of rot, the dead material can be cut away. But if the disease has progressed, the whole root is ruined. Scientists partly blame white flies for spreading the disease from plant to plant. Brown streak also spreads if farmers sell or give away cuttings of infected plants. Cassava has many food uses, but the plant is not safe to eat unless it is specially prepared. It must be processed through methods like boiling, grinding, or fermenting. A substance that can produce deadly levels of cyanide when eaten must be removed. And that's the VOA Special English Agriculture Report. This is the VOA Special English Agriculture Report. Pigweed is a weed that spreads fast and grows up to two meters tall. It can overpower cotton and other crops. It comes from the amaranth family and is also known as Palmer amaranth or Palmer's pigweed. A cultivated version of amaranth is grown for food and medicine in Africa and Asia. In the United States, some people buy amaranth as a gluten-free substitute for wheat flour. But wild pigweed is a big problem in cotton-growing states in the South. And now the plant is spreading into the Midwest. In many cases, the pigweed is killing genetically modified cotton and soybeans. For years, farmers could control it by spraying with Roundup or glyphosate, made by Monsanto. But weed scientist William Curran at Pennsylvania State University says over the past three or four years, pigweed has become resistant to glyphosate. Now, farmers in some areas can no longer depend on that popular herbicide alone to defend against pigweed. He says farmers can try other herbicides or they can mix another herbicide with Roundup and use the mixture when they would normally spray their fields. The reality is even though we have this weed, this one weed that is resistant, there's still a lot of other weeds that Roundup still kills. Farmers in the American Northeast face a growing threat from another weed. Scientists call it horse weed. Farmers call it mare's tail. Like pigweed, this plant has also developed the ability to resist glyphosate. Professor Curran sees one major reason for this. Farmers are depending too much on individual products and not enough on different strategies to manage weeds. The question, he says, is how best to use a system of integrated pest management to control weeds. For example, IPM calls for farmers to rotate their crops instead of planting the same ones 
in the same soil year after year. Professor Curran says farmers should also consider planting cover crops. These crops are grown temporarily to protect the soil. For instance, planting rye in the fall can suppress horseweed. If you have winter rye out there occupying that space, it's very competitive and the horseweed is less successful in establishing. In the next two or three years, several companies expect to have new herbicides along with crops that can survive spraying with those chemicals. And that's the VOA Special English Agriculture Report. If you have a farm, tell us how you manage weeds. Share your comments at voaspecialenglish.com. For VOA Special English, I'm Carolyn Prasuti. From VOA Learning English, this is the Agriculture Report. The United States Congress has been debating a new farm bill. This is a huge five-year plan that includes support programs for American farmers. Government payments make up 8% of the income of farmers growing such major crops as maize, wheat, soybeans, cotton, and peanuts. That 8% is one of the lowest levels of support among developed countries. The Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development says the average among its members is 20%. One reason for the low payments is high global crop prices. The price supports or subsidies that pay farmers when prices are low have not been used very much recently. Grain prices are high. Farmers have earned record or near record profits in the past few years. But they still receive about $5 billion every year in what are called direct payments. These payments go to farmers whether crop prices are high or low. Farmers do not even have to grow a crop to get direct payments. Now, Congress wants to cut between 20 and $40 billion from farm subsidies. Even the largest farmers group, the American Farm Bureau Federation, expects that direct payments will end soon. Mary Kay Thatcher is the chief lobbyist for the group. She says the payments are hard to justify politically, but there are proposals to increase subsidies once crop prices go down again. One version would let farmers receive payments with higher market prices. Another would protect a farmer's total income when prices fall. David Orden is an economist with the International Food Policy Institute. He says both versions would anger farmers in other countries. For VOA Learning English, I'm Laurel Bowman.